go into the world. And tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What you need to know right now. A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's good to be on with you. Praise be to God. The fourth turning. Uh, there are historians that believe history repeats itself some of which are saying it repeats itself in cycles, four cycles, and the fourth one is the age of crisis. It is the time of war, and uh, some believe that's where we are at right now. We're going to have a conversation about that today on the program. Andreas Enriquez from Asa Prensa, uh, CNA in Venezuela, is going to be on the team today. There is big things happening in Venezuela. Too few people are actually talking about it and reporting on it. But uh, big things are happening down there post their election results. The people are coming out in droves. Maduro has basically locked up the polls and said, hey, I won. That's it. That's all there is. There's nothing to see here. Move along, move along. Well, they're having a different opinion now. And it seems that the military might be on the side of the people now. Big things, big changes. What does this all mean? We're going to have a conversation about that with Andreas Enriquez at 14 past the hour. But there's a book called The Fourth Turning is Here by Neil Howe. Again, does history repeat itself? Does it work in cycles? Many people believe it does. Arthur Schlesinger said it repeated itself from liberalism to conservatism and back again over and over again. Well, we want to we want to test that theory uh, with Dr. Derek Taylor from Controversies in Church History. We're going to put a link to his website in the show notes today. But uh, I wonder, what does he think about this cycle theory of history? I want to know what you think about it, too. We're going to put up a poll and you're going to ask for your opinion as well, because if it's true, then we are in the age of crisis, the age of war. Are we repeating, like, say, the the fall of the Western Roman Empire or let's just say the, the French Revolution? Where are we on the timeline? What's coming next? I think we're all asking those questions, and I think we all have kind of a clue. But more on that in the program today. We'll put links to everything we talk about in the show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Get you signed up to the podcast, the email, and so much more. Again, thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Let's pray. Let's dump, jump in. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember. O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And now your saint of the day. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. Ignatius was born to a Spanish noble family in the year of our Lord, 1491. He was a worldly and carefree young man, though not without certain virtues. He distinguished himself as a soldier until his leg was broken by a cannonball, ending his military career and leaving him with a pronounced limp. As Ignatius recuperated in his father's castle in Loyola, he was brought spiritual works to read instead of the adventure tales he requested. He was soon overcome with remorse for past sins. Encouraged by a brief vision of Our Lady, Ignatius took a vow of chastity, abandoned his sword and other possessions, and made a pilgrimage to Rome and the Holy Land, having also begun writing what would become his famed spiritual exercises. Upon his return, Ignatius embraced a vocation to the priesthood, And in the year of our Lord, 1534, he and a few companions, including St. Francis Xavier, founded the Society of Jesus, with Ignatius elected the first superior general. Ignatius himself never used the word Jesuit, which was originally a term of mild mockery that the society eventually claimed as their own. Ignatius died in Rome in the year of our Lord, 1556, and is hailed as a patron of soldiers and Catholic retreats. For more about this day and others in the Church's calendar, 
visit thestationofthecross.com slash saintsandseasons. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. And now your headline news. Daily Wire reports journalist at Olympics suspended for saying John Lennon's Imagine is a vision of communism. John Lennon's Imagine was sung by French singer Juliette Armanet at the opening ceremony that took place on the Saint River in Paris on Friday. While it was playing, a Polish journalist and sports commentator said on air, quote, this is a vision of communism, unfortunately, close quote. The public broadcaster TVP later issued a statement that made it clear that the well-known commentator would not be commentating on air from Paris anymore. Conservative President Andrzej Duda and the former Polish Prime Minister blasted the move by TVP. The Hill reports Israel strikes Hezbollah target in Beirut. Israel said on Tuesday that it carried out a targeted strike in Beirut, Lebanon, against the Hezbollah commander responsible for the rocket attack that struck a soccer field in northern Israel and killed 12 children and teenagers. The strike marks the first significant operation by the Israel Defense Forces in retaliation for the deadly Hezbollah rocket attack. While the IDF carried out strikes against Hezbollah targets in Lebanon in the immediate aftermath, a more substantial retaliation is still expected after the Israeli Security Cabinet agreed on Sunday to give Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the Israeli Defense Minister Yov Gallant expanded authority to respond further. And Real Clear Politics is reporting Acting Secret Service Chief played key role in limiting resources for Donald Trump. Acting Secret Service Director Ronald Rowe was directly involved in denying additional security resources and personnel, including counter snipers, to former President Donald Trump rallies and events despite repeated requests by the agents assigned to the Trump detail in the two years leading up to his July 13 attempted assassination. According to several sources familiar with the decision-making, it was Rowe's decision alone to deny counter-sniper teams to any Trump event outside of the driving distance from D.C., these sources asserted. Just yesterday on Capitol Hill, acting director Rowe seemed to place the blame of the July 13 assassination attempt on local assets who were assigned to cover the building where the shooter was found. Secret Service whistleblowers are predicting yet another attempt on Donald Trump's life before the election. Let's prove that they're wrong about that. And those those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from um, Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46. Jesus said to his disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field, which a person finds and hides again and out of joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field again the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls when he finds a pearl of great price he goes and sells all that he has and buys it the gospel of the Lord praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Haydock's commentary said this hidden treasure is the gospel of Christ, which conducts to the kingdom of heaven. Thus, he who by the knowledge which the gospel affords has found the kingdom of heaven should purchase it at the expense of everything most near and dear to him. He cannot pay too, mo- too great a price for this purchase. Are you prepared to pay all that you have, everything, without exception, for this treasure? Valid question. I'm going to guarantee not everybody's going to say yes to that. The great commentary of Cornelius Alapade said, tropologically, St. Gregory says, by the treasure understands heavenly desire. He says the treasure being found is hid that it may be preserved because it is not enough for a man to guard the zeal of his heavenly desire from the wicked spirits who does not hide the same from the praise of men. In this present life, we are, as it were, in a road by which we are going to our country. Wicked spirits like robbers beset our path. He, therefore, who openly carries his treasure in the way desires to be robbed of it. (laughs) 
He goes on, he means the faithful ought with a great zeal to provide themselves with the doctrine and life of the gospel, which is the way and the price of the kingdom of heaven. As a merchant seeks for pearls and buys the one of them, which is most precious, for otherwise the kingdom or the gospel itself is properly compared to a pearl rather than to a merchant man. For as this pearl was beyond all price, so is the gospel. Symbolically, Cornelius Elapide says the precious pearl is Christ, also the Blessed Virgin, also the religious state, also charity. For charity is a precious pearl without which nothing can profit thee whatsoever thou mayest have, says St. Augustine. For charity is the necklace of Christ. Also a precious pearl is the contemplative life concerning which Christ said of Magdalene, Mary hath chosen the good part. A pearl is also the soul of every man. It is also eternal felicity. For all these are principal parts of the kingdom of heaven, of the doctrine of the gospel. Such likewise is humility, even as our Thomas teaches, being taught of God himself, If thou wishest profitably to know and to learn anything, love to be unknown and to be counted as nothing. This is the loftiest and most useful knowledge, truly to know and despise thyself. This is the most precious gospel pearl, but it is worth unknown to the proud children of Adam. So let's choose. Let's give it all up for the glory of God and for that gospel, that precious treasure. And let's hide it in our heart. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's good to be on with you. Praise be to God. A Dr. Derek Taylor's back on the program at 30 past the hour. There's a book out called The Fourth Turning is Here that basically sets up the concept of History repeats itself in 80-year cycles, and uh, it basically points out that we'd be in the end part of this last cycle, which means war. So is that true? Dr. T- Dr. Derek Taylor is going to push back on that coming up at 30 past the hour. Do join us if you can. But there is a lot of things happening down in Venezuela right now. I mean, big things. People are coming out, and we're all wondering what is really going on there, what is going to happen next and will this be a, uh, a turning of events in Venezuela for the good? Because the election results have been hotly contested by many countries and the people themselves. Joining us now to talk about this from uh, Asa Prensa is Andreas Enriquez. Good morning to you, Andreas. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. Good morning, Joe. Thank you for having me. Uh, I understand you are in Venezuela right now in Caracas. Is that true? Tell us what's going on there right now. Yes, I'm in Caracas. So the situation in Caracas and all over the country is really complicated and delicate right now. It's really volatile. Um, On Sunday, Venezuelans demonstrated their democratic spirit by going massively uh, to vote throughout the day. And all major projections and uh, the most serious national, international polls gave Edmundo Gonzalez a a wide advantage against Nicolas Maduro. Um, but at the end of the day, really late at night, the Venezuelan electoral body um, communicated uh, very different results from what the opposition says um, uh, was the, uh, uh, the will that Venezuelans express with their votes. Um, on Monday, the same electoral body proclaimed uh, Maduro the winner of the election without publishing definitive results and without any transparency. They didn't even publicate the uh, tally sheet that would prove that uh, the results uh, the results are true. So this um, um, this um, several protests, uh, major and spontaneous protests in many cities of the country took place after this announcement that are quickly escalating in violence. In fact, four deaths has been recorded um, wow. since then, since Monday. Um, all of them people that, are, that were uh, under 25 years of age. So the situation is really complicated. Um, what will happen is unknown. 
um, the great majority of Venezuelans that in fact repudiate Maduro and Chavismo um, are waiting for Maria Corina Machado's instructions, which uh, she's the leader of the opposition. And uh, on Monday, she also asks people to take the streets and to, to defend victory. And she, uh, she has expressed her will that, to defend uh, the victory. She claimed the victory um, until the end and until the last consequences. I've seen reports uh, on X in particular that suggest <laughs> that the military, or at least some of the military units and some police units, have basically taken off their uniforms to join the people and refuse to participate in violence towards the people. Are those reports accurate? I think that are really a few cases. Um, until now, I think that there is no sign of um, the military and the police forces to stop uh, the repression and the violence against the people. Um, the Maduro regime, I think it's important to considerate it, not, not as a, a conventional dictatorship, but as a criminal organization. They work as a criminal organization and they operate as one. So if the opposition can't uh, build a, it, and it's difficult to say this, but if the opposition can build a power that is big enough and that is violent enough to confront uh, Chavismo and Maduro uh, and to depose them from power, then I, my opinion is that it's going to be nearly impossible to overthrow them. Wow. So despite the large number of people that have come out to protest and despite the groundswell of popular support, uh, for having a, like a, a transparency of the election results, are you suggesting that Maduro is not going to go anywhere? He's not. He's not budging. The uh, Maduro regime and Chavismo um, supports their power through violence and through uh, firepower. So wow. Um, over the years, uh, the people uh, have taken the streets several times, and. It just hasn't worked ever. So um, I think that is uh, this time it does feel a little different and it does feel kind of real because uh, Maria Corina Machado has said that she's not like uh, all the political leaders that have failed to overthrow Maduro over the past few years. The fact is that the fact is that Venezuelans have felt betrayed by opposition leaders in the past years that have made pacts with Maduro to dismantle the popular pressure on the streets and and yeah the people just felt betrayed so if maria corina machado and mundo gonzalez can prove in the coming hours and in the coming days that in fact they are different from other leaders then we maybe have a shot to depose maduro let me ask you a hypothetical question let's let's just say for the sake of the conversation that the people get what they want. Maduro goes away. He he gets deposed and this new government comes in. Do you think that they will be successful in establishing a, a, a government that can be trusted by the people, that will represent the people? Or is the bureaucracy the, of the Maduro regime so in, in, uh, entrenched that there's no real way to have a successful change? I mean, I think it's going to be really difficult. Um, Maduro and Chavismo controls every power of the states uh, of the state, sorry, and um, and beyond that, it's been over twenty five years of communist regime, of criminal communist regime in the country that has just destroyed the country. So, um, if you go out to the streets, you can easily tell that the basic services don't work, that the hospitals are destroyed, that the public schools. Uh, only operate two days a week, um, and that the salary is barely enough to eat. And beyond that, and I think that this is the gravest um, uh, damage that Chavismo has uh, made to the country, there is a great moral, um, human, and spiritual uh, degradation that I think is going to take many years to, to fix. So... If the opposition can um, depose Maduro in the in the coming days or weeks or months, I think I think it's still it's still going to be really difficult for them to govern the country. What what are the Catholic bishops? What is the clergy saying about all of this? I think that the Catholic Church in Venezuela has been really really courageous, not only in the past uh, few days, but. Also, in in the last years and since the Chavista regime was established back in '98, 
um, the church has strongly denounced every outrage of the regime against the people, even though it has earned them great persecution and danger. And so I think that um, we should be really proud of our bishops that are continuing continually um, raising their voices against Maduro and against the regime. And they have told uh, yesterday and in, in the past days that um, they they are accompanying the people in physically and material and in a spiritual manner. And they also have told the Venezuelan electoral body that the tallies are need to publish the tallies to see if the result, in fact, is what they say it is. How much do you think the people of Venezuela are influenced, inspired by, impacted by what happened in Argentina recently, or say other movements without either uh, South America or even like we're, we're seeing in France right now and other parts of the world. Do you think the people of Venezuela are seeing what's going on outside and saying, we want this for ourselves? Yes. Um, I think that uh, Venezuelans have a, a great um, political ideology and they, the country is mostly Catholic. So um, we know, and the people know that communism is just evil. So um I think that Venezuelans just don't want to live uh, one more day in misery, uh, in in dangers. If you t- if you go out to the streets on your daily basis, um, and I think that uh, other countries are are a great example for us in Venezuela. Mm. Uh, what, so what happens next here? What do you think? Well, is this going to get worse? Are we going to see an armed conflict? Are we going to see civil war in Venezuela? What will happen? I don't think that uh, we will see civil war in Venezuela because one side just don't have any firepower. The people is unarmed. And what I do think is that, as I said to you, Chavismo operates as a criminal organization and they're willing to everything to um, remain in power. I mean, they are killers, they are uh, drug dealers, they are terrorists, and they will act as one. So um, Maria Corina Machado and the opposition also have said that uh, they are willing to go until the end and until the last consequences. So I, I don't see any any of the sides um, like backing down from from trying to r- remain up or to grab power. So I don't really know what will happen is unknown. Um, and I pray to God that uh, there is any violence in the coming days and more. Yeah, me too. Edmundo Gonzalez, what can you tell me about him? I mean, if if the reports are accurate and true, and he's received 67% of the vote, that's, that's a landslide. Um, what kind of a man is he? What does he stand for? Edmundo Gonzalez uh, became known for the Venezuela people only a few months ago after Maria Corina Machado, who uh, Chavismo didn't want her to uh, run for the presidency. And after they legally inhabilitate her for uh, running for the presidency, she um, asked asked Edmundo Gonzalez to to be the candidate. So she he, he has um, seventy four years old. He has a diplomatic career in Venezuela, and I think that he's a great figure and a great candidate for the presidency. And uh, it was demonstrated by the election with that um, great majority that uh, he got. These demonstrations, although, I mean, I think it would be volatile, as you've sort of described. It's very complicated and volatile. It does seem that the people are being very peaceful in spite of the fact that four people have already died. Uh, are they mostly peaceful uh, demonstrations or are there is there rock throwing, any vandalism, anything like that? The protests in Venezuela throughout the years have been really um, pacific and um, civic. And it's only when the armed forces and the paramilitary groups that Maduro has that shot fire guns against the people that uh, the people starts to like defend themselves with rocks and with um, fire and uh, really um, simple things that um, we have on hand. So... Um, the violence, I think, is on on the other side, and the people is just defending themselves. How do we how do we help the Venezuelan people? What can we do for them? I think that um, showing our situation and really um, supporting Venezuelan people in several manners. I think through social media and through uh, media like your radio would be great. 
I think that international support in this is uh, great um, and very helpful for the cause of freedom for Venezuela. However, I think it's not enough. In the United States, during the uh, administration of President Donald Trump, uh, the United States posed uh, really harsh sanctions against Nicolás Maduro and different Chavista leaders, uh, but they somehow managed to uh, survive and to remain in power. Mm. So I really do think international support is uh, is vital for Venezuela, and it's great, but we I need, think that more forceful. We that. need to raise awareness. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Thank you, Andreas Enriquez from Asa Prensa. Hi, this is Jim Wright, president of the Station of the Cross. The clock is ticking. There is still time to register for a once-in-a-lifetime event that will change your life forever. August 24th, Niagara Falls Convention Center in Niagara Falls, New York. It's the Station of the Cross 25-year anniversary celebration. From 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. is the general event. You'll hear powerful talks from our lineup of inspirational speakers. From 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. is the VIP Gala Dinner, where you can get to know all of our speakers while enjoying a fabulous dinner. Registration for the VIP Dinner, which includes admission to the general event, ends on August 10th. Register today, whether you're interested in just the general event or the VIP Gala Dinner as well. Visit thestationofthecross.com to reserve your spot or to learn more. And thank you for celebrating 20 25 amazing years with the Station of the Cross. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take a Bull Synthesis of Information and Inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. Breitbart reports Tesla recalls 1.8 million vehicles. Tesla has initiated recall of more than 1.8 million vehicles spanning several model years, including Model 3, S, and X vehicles from 2021 to 2024, and Model Y from 2020 to 2024. The issue involves the hood latch assembly, which may fail to detect an unlatched hood after it has been opened. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration highlighted the severity of this problem, noting that if the hood is unlatched, it could fully open while the vehicle is in motion and obstruct the driver's view. Tesla has reported that it is currently unaware of any crashes, injuries, or deaths related to the specific problem. You're not driving anyway, right? You're just napping, so what does it matter? You don't care. The car needs to see, not you. Anyway, CNA reports priest in Austria arrested for producing crystal meth. A Catholic priest in Austria has confessed to producing crystal meth in his parish rectory. Authorities arrested the 38-year-old cleric along with a 30-year-old Iraqi citizen from Vienna last week. During the raid, they seized chemicals and uh, laboratory equipment. Authorities say they suspect the drugs were intended for sale. Both suspects are currently in pretrial detention. The priest, originally from Poland, has been serving in the diocese since 2021. The diocese responded by suspending the priest. Perhaps they should have suspended his Netflix account first. Hmm. Breaking Bad? Anyone? Anyone? Hey, Catholic Vote is reporting Catholic fired by Google win settlement. Former Google executive and devout Catholic Ryan Olahan has obtained a settlement from the big tech company after it allegedly fired him for not being inclusive. Olahan, who in his spare time runs an ice cream shop that employs people with special needs, was fired for being an ableist as he would favor high-performing employees at Google over the DEI stuff. And those, those are your headline news. Praise be to God. Hey, uh, does history repeat itself? That's the question I'm asking today. Do you believe history repeats itself? So far in our straw poll, 86% say yes, 14% say uh, no, but it sure does rhyme. Uh, plagiarizing Mark Twain in the process. Praise be to God. You can leave your vote. Just go to the Catholic, uh, you know, our landing page for the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. You'll see the live video player there and where you can click the YouTube link underneath that. And I'm sure there's a poll going in our telegram group as well, but uh, here to talk about this is Dr. Taylor, Dr. Derek Taylor. He is a uh, professor and he has received his PhD from the University of Kansas. He teaches at Santa Fe in Gainesville, Florida. He also is the host of Controversies in Church History. We'll put a link to it in our show notes today. Dr. Taylor, good morning to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Joe. Good morning to you too. 
So I, I found this book and I've seen lots of conversations on the book. The fourth turning is here. What what the seasons of history tell us about how and when this crisis will end. I found it very, very fascinating. Let me just give you the summary notes here. It basically breaks it up into 80 year segments or cycles. And there's four subsections in each 80 year block. You've got the, 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 the high, the spiritual high. You've got the awakening. You've got the unraveling. You've got the crisis. 80 years ago, that cycle seemed to end in World War II. 80 years before that, it seemed to end in the Civil War. 80 years before that, it seemed to end in the American Revolution. It seems as though history might repeat itself. What say you about that? Yeah, I'm generally skeptical of those sorts of theories, not because they're necessarily wrong, but because you don't really, I don't think you need theories to know that every once in a while, some some sort of big crisis is going to happen. <laughs> um, if you study enough history, and again, it's, it's not exactly 80 years and so, or a timeline and things of that nature. And anyone anyone who uh, is trained professionally, like in academic history, they're skeptical of that, of that for a couple of reasons. One is that they are taught, and this is beat into your head from day one, they are taught that, you know, history is contingent. They put a lot of emphasis on, well, things could have been different if, you know, this thing had happened, right? It's not necessarily happening in these sort of like regular cycles of things. Um, history is messy. That's usually how people put it. It's very messy. It doesn't work out in these these neat patterns. I don't deny, by the way, there are patterns, but you talk about repeating versus rhyming and stuff like that. They don't exactly match up. And in my in my in my experience, like there's there's definitely like parallels, but they're not exact. And I think a lot of people what they want from that kind of theory is, oh, we know what's going on right now because we have this pattern. And the fact mm. of the matter is, it doesn't really work like that. Um, and by the way, you talk about something like a crisis or like, you know, patterns of decline. Right. Because. I, I think it's I, I don't think you need a big theory to say, well, it looks like the America is kind of in decline right now. I, I don't yeah. think it's, by the way, uh, I don't think it's an existential decline. I think the country is going to like die anytime soon. But like, you know, I, I don't need the theory because I lived through it. I lived <laughs> I grew up in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, things are worse than they were in the 80s and 90s. But it's not like, um, you know, we're about to be overrun by the by the barbarian hordes, at least not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so let's talk about the end of the fall of the Western Roman Empire. There's lots of sure. patterns there or, or similarities I think we can draw out. The economic mm-hmm. crisis in the West was quite large, and they couldn't they couldn't even mm-hmm. maintain their own legions. They had to have those barbarians, those immigrants into the Western Roman Empire to kind of keep status quo, and that didn't work out uh, very well. I mean, I just ask the legion that got decimated in the Rhine. You know, so there's lots of patterns that seem to be uh, corruption within government. The Praetorian Guard picking and choosing the winners and who gets to what who gets to be the emperor and who gets to get assassinated by the way i'm not pointing out july 13th at all in that no not me so it seems like there are some cyclic patterns that you could say well we do see economic crisis we do see immigration crisis we do see corruption in the government today shouldn't that mean that we're about to see a collapse yeah, I mean, it depends. I, I don't think we're about to collapse. I, th- I think things are going badly. I think what you're actually seeing, like all the events in America right now, are not necessarily an absolute decline. America's got a lot of wealth. It'll take a long time to get rid of it and waste it away. <laughs> uh, we're doing a good job of it. Really, we're doing a fine job yeah, of giving well, it away. The thing is, when you're so wealthy, it does take a long time. But I, I think what you're seeing is a ruling class which is trying to – Basically, what it's trying to do is get rid of democracy, literally. Like, I hate to put it that way, but they don't want self-government anymore. And it's basically a sort of political economic war on the middle. Uh, Because the middle class is what can, like, if they vote in a block, um, they can sort of, you know, get around all the things the ruling class in this country wants to do. They clearly don't want to share power that way anymore. And um, that's at least that seems to me. What you're seeing is kind of like a, I don't know how to put it, almost a sort of... uh, cold civil war in a, in a way um but yeah. it's not necessarily absolute decline. it's a decline because this is terrible <laughs> don't get me wrong this is awful uh and it is a decline because we had you know there are a lot of things that go into this this is complex like we you know, weren't this divided you know 50 60 years ago a lot of this stuff starts in the 60s obviously that's where a lot of the rot starts but that's the weird thing you can have this rot while the country is still very wealthy and relatively powerful i remember it's a different thing, like decline in moral and cultural terms and decline in terms of like your power. 
because the United States is still mo- the most powerful country in the world. It's declined from what it was in the 20th century. But in the 20th century, it might have been the most powerful country that ever existed, relatively speaking, at least for a couple of moments, right? Like after World War II, like I remember reading somewhere that like I think by 1948, the United States in 1948 possessed like 42 percent of the world's wealth, which is far more than any other country in history has ever. And the reason why is because World War II destroyed half the world's economy. (laughs) It wasn't going to last. Uh, but also in the 1990s, right after the fall, uh, after the Cold War ended, that was our you know unipolar moment. We had you know it was our world. We we're recreating and all this stuff. Um, those things were were bound to decline in relative terms. Uh, I'm just not ready to say we're 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 done as a power. No, we just have really really awful rulers. <laughs> yeah. and it would be, you'd be shocked if you had really a, a better ruling class how things could change. But uh, are we ever going back to like the 20th century was the American century? That's not been coming back. That's gone. In that sense, yeah, we have already already declined, I guess. Mm. Arthur Schlesinger and his son, uh, they both proposed cycles, but in a more <clears throat> sort of a more basic way than Neil Howe has. They basically say, yeah. you know, time shifts between liberal and conservative. It's like a pendulum. It just swings back and forth, back and forth. Um, do you see it, it, it at least in that simplistic way where, you know, people, their <clears throat> mood shift and <clears throat> This explains why sure. we vote Democrat one way and then liberal and, and uh, rep- or conservative and Republican the other way. And it just seems to go back and forth and back and forth. Nothing gets better or changes for the good. It just kind of goes back and forth. To a certain degree, that's true. I actually have more sympathy with that because what they're almost sort of talking about is sort of a generational cycles. That actually seems more real to me. You do see that. Um, you see that, you know, to take a Catholic example – in the priesthood right now, there's been a, I mean, everyone, you know, this, and this is, this is, makes me feel good. Is like you read articles in the New York times about all, oh, all those young American priests, they're not on board with Pope Francis's vision. I'm like, yes, I know. Uh, and so, um, yeah, that, that generational shifts happen. You have a generation reacting to their parents. You have, again, and this, it hasn't happened yet in the United States. At some point, you figure we'll get tired of all the the the, the moral laxness, and will be. But that happens too, right? You'll have a reaction against moral laxness, uh, and so and vice versa, right? You'll have an overly uh, draconian, puritanical society, and then and their children will want to loosen things up and stuff like that. That makes sense, yeah. In those general terms, sure, there are cycles like that. Um, it, it's more like the the more the thing where I get, <clears throat> excuse me. Morning. Um, <laughs> the more where I, I get skeptical about those bigger theories is they make well we can predict the next shift. I'm like eh, that's a little that's a little harder to predict. Sometimes nobody was. I guess they should have been. People were talking about this actually. Um, Trump getting shot. I've heard that constantly. So that was and people have said yeah he's they're definitely going to try to assassinate him um, because yeah. he is he, again he seems to be outside of this ruling clique. Uh, whatever it has. That's the thing. You don't even know who the ruling class is, but you know some of the big names. You know that whatever the Bezos is and the, the Gates is, but it's broader than that. Uh, who's actually running the country? Who's pulling the strings? And so, but um, I, I don't deny at all. There's definitely decline going on. though. George Santiana said, uh, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I was reminded of this fairly recently when uh, Vladimir Putin said, hey, listen, guys, if you're going to continue down this road of trying to put missiles on my doorstep, then I'm going to feel like I can go ahead and start producing nuclear weapons again. Even though we had a unilateral agreement, <laughs> uh, we're going to be free from that. We're just going to go back to the Cold War. And now they're aligning with China and Iran and these other powers of the Axis. Are we finding the Axis and the allies lining up again? I mean, it just seems like we're about to repeat that dance, which led to world destruction, loss of millions of lives, economic collapse, and so much more, which then led to what? The baby boomer generation giving us things like uh, contraception and marriage on, on divorce on demand and and all manner of insanities. So I don't know, Dr. Taylor. It does seem to rhyme pretty well. Well, what it is, they're trying to... I think our leadership, they want to sort of freeze the 1990s. They want to make the unipolar moment last forever, and they can't do it. And that's why this, this is happening. I mean, everything that's been done, like toward Russia, the whole purpose of this is to keep, for reasons that escape me, to keep Europe as our sort of poodle. Really, that's what they are. They're basically our client states, the entire continent. 
And I don't know, <laughs> I don't mm. know why it's not necessary. It's a waste of money. <clears throat> I guess they don't want to lose the influence. I mean, we'd have influence anyway. The United States doesn't need Europe to have influence over the world. Uh, I mean, I, that's why I mean, everyone knows we blew up the pipeline. Like everyone knows the United States did that. Like you had to be right. stupid to think that was somebody else. And it just, it's just, again, again, it's there. And there's definitely, you know, something there. But I, I don't know about rhyming, but it, it's definitely, it's definitely, you just have, the decline I usually find is the decline of the quality of people running your society. That's the decline. Yeah. And yeah. From one generation to the next, you no, know, you can't predict that. That's the thing. You know, I used to give this lecture in my Western Civ classes on the Roman Empire, right? And I talked about Augustus and I, I repeated something I learned from, you know, some textbook I was looking at and, you know, hear your lectures and, I said the one thing that Augustus didn't uh, didn't do was solve the succession problem, right? He didn't solve like the peaceful transfer of power and all this stuff. And, and I, I gave that same lecture every year, year on year. And I think about that phrase: he didn't solve the succession problem. Then I realized one day I was like, who the hell has solved the succession? <laughs> Hold that thought. The succession. Hold that thought right there, because I kind of want to jump into that coming up after the break in relation to the Olympics debacle. I mean, it seems like the French Revolution is alive and well. It doesn't have to repeat because it never ended, it seems. I want to get his take on that coming up after the break. And your take, your poll is up and your opinion can be heard. We're going to talk about that, too, coming up after the break. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, don't forget, you're going to run out of time super fast if you don't get registered for the big event coming up in Niagara Falls, August the 24th. The cutoff is August 10th. It's a big conference. It's a gala dinner. Bishop Strickland is going to be there. Raymond DeRorio is coming. Father Mateg, Mother Miriam. Candace Owens is going to share her journey into the Catholic Church. What led her to where she's at today? Uh, Jim Havens is going to be there. I'm going to be there. Producer Jake is going to be there. We want you to be there, too. Go to the thestationofthecross.com to find the details. There's a, a list of the talks, and the schedule is up there, plus discounts at local hotels. Come hang out with us. If you can go to the conference alone, great. If you can go to both the gala and the conference, even better. Again, the thestationofthecross.com. But hurry Time is running out. You just got about 10 days left. We're having a conversation right now with Dr. Derek Taylor from uh, Controversies in Church History. Church, uh, what is it? Churchcontroversies.com is the website. We'll put a link to it in the show notes, churchcontroversies.com. Dr. Taylor, welcome back to the show. Uh, So we're talking about the history repeating itself and sort of pushing back on that a little bit. Fair enough. Praise be to God. But let's go to the Olympics for a second. What was your take uh, on the Olympic opener, uh, I, I want to put this on the table before you before you do let us know because one thing for sure is crazy, wild shenanigans in the openers is not new. It seems to have been around for a while. So the idea of some crazy person putting together all of this uh, is not new. However, this seems to have taken it up to a new level. What say you? Yeah, I I, 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 have to say, I have not seen it. I don't watch the Olympics. Uh, I didn't watch this. Uh, I, I couldn't avoid it because it was all over my social media. Everybody's yeah. like talking about it, and so I, it's clear. I, but first of all, it's clearly people are talking about you know whose intentions did they do this intentionally? Like it seems obvious that if it's not totally intentional, it's at least partially intentional. Uh, like you said, it's not new. People have been doing this for a long time. I think I read somewhere that the, the 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 actual person who organized this, whatever this was, uh, was someone who actually, I guess he came from a rural area in France, and this was I guess his way of like ingratiating himself with the with the uh, the the elites of Paris or something like this. Um, it doesn't matter; it's meant to blaspheme God and insult everybody else, and it, it gets it, it really to me it's meant to be demoralizing. I think. Because it's so constant. This stuff never ends. Like we talk about, it's, like I say, it ramps it up. Like you mentioned repeating. You don't have to repeat when it never really ends. It really doesn't. Yeah. Uh, this yes. constant, like, well, just constant, like, insults. And it's, like I said, it's blasphemy. Well, and, what's interesting uh, is, I admit, I and there, 
in comparing, like, the, say, the French Revolution to <laughs> what was displayed before our eyes on Friday night, I mean, I didn't watch it either, but the social media, you know, you could pick it all up. Oh, right, not anymore. Yeah. By the way, by the way, the Olympics committee blocked my video, my show yesterday. They uh, they asked YouTube to take my video down because <laughs> they did not like me playing any clips from that from that event. And the clip I played was Celine Dion. I didn't even play the worst of it. I didn't even play the worst. Oh, of it. Let wow. that sink in for a second. Seventeen eighty nine. Too. <laughs> In 1789, when the French Revolution gets uh, gets uh, pretty intense, it seems to me. I mean, listen, uh, I I I don't have a PhD in history, but I was the 10th grade history student of the year at Judson High School uh, outside of San Antonio, Texas, pretty much making me an expert in history at that point. So I would say uh, there is parallels here because when the French Revolution wanted to take down King Louis and the and the idea of monarchy, they attacked the, the church because these two things are connected intimately. And they attacked the church in a perverse, disgusting, and blasphemous way, <clears throat> murdering priests and Catholic laity, committing uh, uh, you know, very sacrilegious and blasphemous and sexualized uh, liturgies of sorts in Notre Dame is a classic example, and much, much more. Aren't, didn't we see – isn't this – basically a nod to that? Oh, like I said, I think it's more or less continuing. You're right. I and mean, this stuff has not stopped since the, like the enlightenment, this, like you mentioned mock liturgies you could do with like satire in the media. Um, people have been sharing on social media, by the way, like the whole idea of Marie Antoinette saying, you know, let them eat cats made up. That was made up by revolution, the you know radical press in the, in the 1780s, 1790s. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not even, a, you know, you don't have to repeat something that never stopped uh, is my point. And yes, there's th that connection. Yeah, that's definitely there. And they're certainly thinking of that. They actually, they, they venerate that stuff uh, in Paris, in France, these Republicans. And so, and it, yes, it is, it is a direct inversion of, yeah, the faith. Uh, it's a direct version of, of nature. Like that's, that's another thing too, is like, it's a, you know, uh, an inversion of the natural order. All those things were, ob to me, obviously meant by that stuff. Mm. You, know, you had apparently you had a bunch of people in drag, and there was apparently a little kid, I guess, in this, this yeah. thing, like, right next to a guy who's like whose junk was hanging out or something like right. that. Again, I, yeah. I saw some disgusting. Um, but I will say this: a good thing about this is you mentioned like they do seem to have been like forced to like take this stuff. That people pushing back did help. And I have to say this because mm. every time I talk on the radio or something, I write an article, I, I tend to be really critical of the bishops. It seemed like the Paris, the, the French bishops issued a statement. You know, uh, Bishop Barron went on, went on uh, social media and basically called them out on this. So good for them. They did their jobs. So, but the fact we have to go through this constantly is, you know, and you have, by the way, the point is you have to do that. You absolutely have to push back against it every time, even though it's tiresome. I find it just so tedious, but you have to to do it. Um, yeah. For okay. So it, in uh, earlier in the show, I talked to uh, uh, the correspondent from ACL Prinza and um, about Venezuela. Venezuela seems to be tired yeah. of the communist regime that has ruled its country uh, almost to ruin yeah. there for the last 25 years. It seems like the citizens in England are getting tired of the liberal crazy shenanigans that are happening in their government. Uh, same thing in Ireland. The people of France seem to be getting concerned or, or Italy. But I argue that although they're pushing back and they definitely want something, so we're seeing a swing there, as uh, Schlesinger would say. We're seeing the swing from liberalism to conservatism to traditionalism. And yet what I don't see in that, and this is what I want you to comment on, is I don't see a re-embracing of Christendom itself. There's not a real push to bring back marriage between a man and a woman and defend it like it's the bedrock of society, for instance, as an example. Do you see that? It's like they want their cake and eat it too, so to speak. They want their conservatism, uh, but they don't really want Christendom. That's that's a good point. I think I agree with that because I think what you see here, and this is with our elites too, I think they want – they want the goods that natural marriage bring. They want the goods that a Christian society, like you like toleration. You like all these sorts of things like, like Western style toleration. Well, it's only really existed in, in countries that used to be Western Christendom. And that, that seems to be the, the, the case everywhere. You're right. They want that. They want the, um, they want the results of that without actually having to pay the price <laughs> for creating yeah. something like that. 
because it didn't yeah. happen overnight. Those things, those those societies took centuries to build. Um, I, I see that a lot. Yeah, and I, that's I think that's a fair, fair and accurate statement. Yeah, the bar is just too low. It seems to me at the Trump rally we get. Uh, the RNC, we get uh, Kid Rock and it, Kamala Harris's rally yesterday. You get a rapper dropping curse words left and right and sexually uh, lyric, sexualized lyrics in front of kids. I'm like, this is where we're at, America. We we demand better. We're just about out of time here with Dr. Derek Taylor. Churchcontroversies.com is his website. Encourage you to check that out. But I want to get your take and your opinion on this. We're going to go into the after show and you can share with us what you're thinking right now. There's a straw poll over on YouTube. Do you believe history repeats itself? 85% say yes. 15% say no. But it sure does rhyme. We'll get your take on that, your commentary directly after uh, we go into the after show, which is a live video feed on the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT, where you can come hang out with us. You can also comment directly. You have icons underneath for YouTube and Facebook and Rumble. Even though my video yesterday, my show was taken down by YouTube. Thank you, Olympics. You're the best. You can still find it on Rumble. You can even find the podcast available. Have you left us a five-star review on Spotify or on the Apple iTunes store? Help us reach a whole new audience. Leave us a five-star review. That would be amazing. It would be a great act of support and service for what we're trying to do here. We'll see you guys right back here with Father Chris Alar tomorrow morning. God love you. The Station of the Cross began broadcasting in Buffalo, New York in 1999. Since then, our listening areas have multiplied and expanded into several states. While our mission is to grow the Catholic faith through radio and other media outlets, our apostolate is supportive of but independent from your local diocese. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. And we're back. Welcome to the after show, everyone. Hey, good morning, everybody. Praise be to God. So what do you think? What do you think? Does history repeat itself? I, uh, Dr. Taylor is still with us, but there's no way he could be correct about that. Of course it repeats itself every 80 years, <laughs> like, clo- like clockwork, like clockwork. Precision. I should say I'm more open. I'm more open to that idea than I used to be. Like yeah, there, there are there are definitely continuities in history, and so it's not like it's it's like yeah. crazy or anything. It's just like, do we know exactly what moment we're living in? Because that's the thing mm-hmm. I got from reading a lot of history, just doing it myself. Was people when they're going through some big event, they don't genuinely know like like where things are. It's much easier in retrospect to see, oh, this this could happen. At the end of the way. day, so, we're just being control freaks, right? We just yeah. want to know what tomorrow <laughs> exactly. is going to bring before we get there. <laughs> I think like that's it's right. I mean, it's hard. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough to like look at the world the way it is and say I'm going to trust God and not try to like <laughs> know too much yeah. about it. Like that's tough. That is tough. It is. But but it's it's, it, so it's not it's not bad to want in and of itself to want control to want to know things. So I don't right. I don't I don't blame anybody. So I don't, I I used to be look I, I mean I used to be more of a snob about this because you have this <laughs> education and everything. But you get older you're like yeah. Did, did, like you're wrong about so many things, you don't worry about it anymore. <laughs> so, um, so uh, story of my life. Uh, there, there are some. I haven't. I haven't read that book you mentioned. There's a guy who I've read a little bit of who does similar, something similar. The guy's name is Peter Turchin. I think I, I can't remember the names of the books he's written. It's similar. He has this yeah. idea there are there are repetitive cycles, and I think he calls them secular cycles. And like you can you can and especially like I said, I'm I'm more sympathetic than I used to be with things like generational theory. Right. Like the two things change generationally speaking. That does have well, an impact. I that's think what it, fourth turning gets into. Uh, they talk about the okay, generations. Well, In fact, sense. he's got it broken down. This last 80 year period, he's got it broken down. <laughs> you know, the, the high coming off of World War Two. So a war ends and restarts the process, essentially. So right. World War Two happens. Then you get the 50s and 60s. You get the baby boomers and you get growth, growth. <laughs> Everybody's happy. Yeah, things are singing and, and looking great. You can hear the birds chirping, blue sky, sunshine, the whole deal. And then you get an awakening, and that would be the Gen X, okay? That's the populist movements that come in that period. And then, of course, the unraveling with the millennials. And then you get start to get a lot of conflict. And then comes the crisis period under Gen Z 
And basically that's war. That's breakdown of society. And one of the points he makes in the fourth turning is you move from unity of society to a breakdown. So you move, you move from group think to individual think, and that creates breakdown, chaos, war, and restart Mm -hmm. the cycle. And, you know, I got to say, when I saw it, when I thought about that, I thought, okay, that kind of mirrors, like, say, my own spiritual life as far as, like, the cycles in between confessions. Like, I can see the same sort of pattern. When I make a confession, I'm on a high. Like, man, it's good. I'm singing with my wife, with my kids. I'm like, I'm feeling good because I just came out of the confessional. I reconcile with God. I I feel good. This is great. I can finally receive worthily. But then as time goes by and I and I get further from that confession, I start to break down yeah. and I start to separate from the unity of my family into individualism and separation. And it ends in chaos and confusion and arguments and breakdown in my family, and my house. And then I got to get a confession again and we start restart the cycle. So because I can sort of relate to what Neil Howe was trying to say, I'm thinking, OK, I can see it personally and individually. I can guess I can kind of see it also in a societal level too. It does kind of make sense. Um, but I would say that's more of a, a, obviously a natural thing. Like that's because of concupiscent nature right. that we see that. And yeah. so I don't have a problem yeah, with it from absolutely. that perspective. James 16897, <laughs> Damon, Paul, good morning to you. Troy Lockett, Mike K, praise be to Jesus. Welcome to the team, Mike. Glad you're here. Going to miss you in Buffalo though, brother. Janice. Karen Andy Bashaw, uh, good morning to you. Yvonne, good morning and welcome. Nick the Mike, Ave Maria to you, my friend. Good morning, praise be to God. Did uh, Damon did get the poll up? Does history repeat itself? He's uh, the poll on Telegram says yes, eighty percent, zero percent for no, but twenty percent for no. But it sure does rhyme. <laughs> Kathy DeLorenzo, <laughs> good morning to you. Becky Hansen, good morning to you. Sci-Fi Mike, praise be to Jesus. Good morning. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Becky says, sometimes, she says, I'm so confused. Sometimes you can feel what is coming by the temperature flowing in the air. Oh, yeah. I, I would agree. We, we Don't we get the premonition like, ooh, a, a big shoe is about to drop? Like, I think we're feeling that post-July 13th Trump assassination, right? Like, we're feeling, like, because well, think of it. Think about think about the series of events that was leading up to this. You get July 13th post assassination attempt followed directly immediately by a coup takeover of the Democrat ticket led by none other than Barack Obama, as reported by The New York Post and as sources from the Biden family itself leaked to The New York Post like that feels pretty big, feels kind of huge. Like, so I think we're all feeling feeling that uh, the shoe is about to drop there for sure. Celine Dion is cyberbullying Joe. I feel so cyberbullied by Celine Dion. Totally. <laughs> yeah, they, totally. Were they clear about what exactly they didn't like, or was it just the general so Olympic like stuff? Oh, man. Ah. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I saw that thing got I might get myself down. in like, trouble by, by, having, by talking about this. I should probably contact an attorney or, <laughs> I don't know, whistle uh, whistleblower <laughs> protection program or something. But, uh they, that's part of the problem with YouTube, the love-hate relationship we have with YouTube. By the way, we just drove – we're at 7.6 million views right now, uh, forty almost 47,000 subs. We're very grateful for the success that we've we've enjoyed on the YouTube platform. But the other side of that same coin is they pull the shenanigans like this. Mm-hmm. So the Olympics gets to file a, hey, we don't want this <laughs> – like all I played was a clip with no audio. I didn't play any – you couldn't hear anything Celine was singing just images and and I didn't play the whole thing just clips of it to make the point and then I moved on and took it off screen and they took down my video for that but in the when they t- when they send you the email they never ever ever tell you exactly what <laughs> it's always vague yeah. well you had copyrighted material okay great show me point can you give me the timestamps exactly of the copyrighted material mm, no Mm-hmm. But you can remove it and then we'll put it back up. Okay, exa- Okay, great. Tell me exactly what to remove and then I might consider that. No, we're not going to tell you that. It's, it's bogus because I have sitting right behind me the uh, the Bible of copyright law, which I had to purchase when I was making my first documentary film. So I wouldn't get you know fined 
uh, or go to prison or something. And uh, according to according to the safe harbor rule, I am completely within my uh, legal allowed a limit to leverage someone else's copyrighted content, someone else's you know uh, material to make a point. And there's no rule that says, well, you're allowed to use 30 seconds or three seconds or t- that does not ha- that's not a thing. You're allowed to use as much as is necessary and no more to make your point. If you need an hour to make that point, according to the safe harbor rule, you're allowed to do that. YouTube has been sued for this very thing. And yeah, and here we are pl- playing these shenanigans. There's no one. Well, again, when I mentioned in class and one of the things they want to control is information obviously um they realized how powerful these media streams can be against them and they, they've been that's one of the big deal that's why they hate elon musk so much like elon musk isn't a conservative or anything but like he right. he's he's open to having criticizing these people and they can't stand it and that's really all it is that i don't know <clears throat> it could be anything with these the youtube they they block for all sorts of silly reasons yes um, so so I don't even know. Thanks, YouTube. You're the best, man. You're the absolute best. You know, it's it's fascinating because we're sitting here watching. I'm sitting here watching all these uh, hearings on Capitol Hill with Secret Service and FBI. Yesterday was very entertaining, to say the least. Um, but I'm sitting here thinking, I would love to have a Capitol Hill hearing with the Olympics Committee because I want to know who at the Olympics <laughs> signed off on the on the opening ceremony plan. Like who rubber stamped that thing? Are you trying to tell me that the Olympics, the Olympics committee took the time to block my video, which is who the heck am I? <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, I'm not even a blip on the radar at YouTube for crying out loud. So it's, if they took the time to block some small time uh, content creator like myself, then surely they would have regulated what that opening ceremony looked like and what it was going to be well before they would have known well before in advance. So the Olympic committee knew that there was going to be blasphemous, scandalous, insulting content in the opening ceremony to put a finger in the eye of, of Catholics in particular, the Christians all over the world. And they said, okay to that. So who, 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 who at the Olympic committee said, okay to that, who's going to lose their job over that. That's my question. If, no, if director, no, if director, no. director Cheadle can be fired or resigned because of her failures and now her <laughs> co-conspirator, I mean, I'm sorry, her partner in crime. I mean, um, I'm rather the deputy director Roe, who's now the acting director. If he can take the job and he can sit on Capitol Hill and blames, blame the local police department for the failure, which is what he did yesterday. Then I want the same treatment for the Olympic committee. I want Matt Gates and Ted Cruz and, you know, Johnson and all the others. I want them to sit up there and lambast the Olympic Committee. I'm just a dream. But, it never, you know, anyway, that's my point. It's like there's no yeah, – well, never going to be that, an that accountability. Dream, right? Well, because of these people, again, our, our, our societies are ruled by these big bureaucracies. And one of, the, one of the, the advantages for these people of these big bureaucracies, you never know who's issuing the orders because there's so many – and there's so many bureaucrats. There's so much stuff going on, and they they don't have to take responsibility for anything. Even even the was it Cheadle who resigned? Like she'll get hired somewhere else. Like that's how this works. Oh, yeah. like you get fired here. You book go tour. With parachute, yeah. Book tour. Yeah. Book tour. Be, be defended by the, by the left wing press and all this stuff. And so it's just it, it's the frustration on people that they they can never get an answer to anything. It's like literally it's like trying to get somebody like on the phone when you want to get something fixed or you're calling like the phone company. You never get an actual human being anymore. It's, it's right. a way of like not having to deal with responsibility. And it's everywhere. It's in everything. Um, it's, and it's, yeah. it, it's everywhere. I, I hate it. I really hate it, obviously. And so I feel your pain, in other words. It's rough. It's rough. Hey, good morning to you, KSW Benedict and Oblate. Need to do a, a deep dive into the cabal, into the into the cabal or uh, Kabbalah, Kabbalah. You talking about the Madonna thing? Kabbalah like Harris, the uh, the Kabbalah Kabbalah <laughs> Harris, the Kabbalah Harris. Uh, oh, uh, it wouldn't Harris. surprise me if she's involved in that. To be honest with you, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, knows. maybe I'll have to I'll have to try to find a guest on that one. Uh, Catherine Hickey, good morning to you, Miriam, Helen Grace, Mac Thompson is here. Morning, morning, y'all. 
I like Mac. That's awesome. Praise be to God. He speaks my language. Uh, Brandon Joseph, good morning to you. He said, it would have to go to confession multiple times if I'm left in the room with the Olympic Committee. <laughs> <laughs> Yay and amen. Linda, good morning to you. Chesty Marine Simplify says, if the IOC is anything like the U.S. Secret Service, they won't know the answer. Exactly. hundred percent. I should do a skit. I should just do a skit on that. It'd be hilarious. Well, Joe, when, um, you, when you were saying that they, they must have known ahead of time, like, mm-hmm. I mean, don't you think the Synod yeah. would have known ahead of time posting that link, uh, that poll on, uh, on social media? Like, I think a lot of times they really do completely, they're, they, they're blind to what the reaction is actually going to be. You know, I you think, think a lot so? of time, a lot of times yeah. they're not expecting that much of a pushback. I'm sure they think they're going to offend people, but the fact that they took it down and like <laughs> are kind of embarrassed at how much pushback they got, I think so, that shows but, that they they don't see everything clearly all the time. They kind of so you're their, going with well, the bubble they theory. Bubble, I, the, yes, right. they still live. Yeah, they yeah, they do. Is, yeah, I'm not I'm not saying that they're all dumb and and they weren't expecting any negative no. pushback, but I think they live in a in a bit <laughs> of a bubble of just how you know how much popularity they have and how much they can get away with. I think they do, you know, they're, they're not necessarily, you know, all knowing, you know, they, the big quote unquote, they are not they. always, you know, they're, they're I've not, they're, they're they. not a monolithic omniscient structure. I've they're had made they up on human, the show. Yes, I remember <laughs> they the, would the disagree yeah. with you. <laughs> they would disagree with you. Yeah. They believe they, they, they are, are omniscient. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You have to remember but that they, they are people too. Not everyone. Not everyone who hates the Catholic Church and and does bad stuff is an omniscient, you know, demon possessed, you know, person. <laughs> you know, the, they are not. You know, it's not Satan himself, like sitting somewhere in the world, right. pulling the strings on every single decision here that's being made. Like people are involved in this too, and people are mm. fallible, even when they're trying to do bad things. They can m- make mistakes too. That's something for people to remember. You know, even when we're trying to say like, oh, you know, I found. This conspiracy, that conspiracy, like remember that there's human beings involved and just because they're against us doesn't mean that they're all powerful and omniscient. <laughs> I don't know. So many people forget. Oh, I there think we go. We know everything. This is a new one. <laughs> he hasn't he hasn't pulled that button out yet. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> You sound you sound like Tim Curry oh, in Legend. Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking. This, yeah, has, was, <laughs> does anyone remember really Legend weird. with Tom Cruise, <laughs> Tim Curry? Uh, I, I, what's her name? Maya Sarah from. Uh, oh Sarah yeah, from, the big Sarah. horns. Yeah, the big giant with the big horns, horns. Yeah, and man, Tom Cruise running around in like in like raggedy short yeah. shorts and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that great, uh, that's uh, a great movie. That's <laughs> funny. That's Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott. Yeah. Um, same guy who made Top Gun. What? That's bizarre. No, that was Tony I, Scott, wasn't it? Oh, his Tony brother? Scott. Yeah, you're right. His brother. Tony Scott who made Top. Um, by the way, his Becky says yeah, yeah. Uh, IOC says, "quote We don't have that information due to ongoing investigations." Close quote. Yeah, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently they may actually work for the same people yes. as the Secret Service, <laughs> or at least have the same PR department. Yes, because, exactly. Man, oh PR man, that sounds very, very familiar. <laughs> but I got to tell you, listen. If you vote for me as Holy Roman Emperor, I promise to get straight to the bottom of this immediately, and I'll pretty much fire everybody. I don't have a problem with that. I'll just, everyone's fired just right out of the gate. You're all fired, and uh, we'll just start from scratch. Okay, so make sure to vote early. Vote often, as we like to say, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as, as many as you can. And uh, if you can get some of your deceased relatives to also vote for me, that, that's very helpful. Very, very helpful. So thank you in advance for your for your vote. Hey, by the way, Nova uh, Nova says Jesus is coming very soon. Well, uh, one, I I would love for Jesus to come very soon and get it all over with. But at the same time, this other side of that coin is a lot of people will probably end up in hell for all eternity in that phase of salvation history. And there's a reason why God is long suffering. He's put up with quite a bit if you think about it. All of the blasphemies, the sacrileges, the offenses that that we have committed, the, those of us that claim to be his his um, his, his disciples, his followers, his subjects, think about how many crimes we've committed. Let alone those that reject him wholesale, as in the example of the ceremony at the Olympics. God puts up with quite a bit. He's long suffering for a reason, and that's because souls go to hell forever. 
And um, he will put up with it for a long time just to try to save as many as possible. So let's pray for the total conversion of these people uh, as w- uh, while we have the opportunity to do so. Linda, good morning to you. Lori, Jane, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Linda's <coughs> a- a bringing up a frightening thought. What is the closing ceremony going to look like? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. That is kind of scary. Don Paddock, Patty, good morning to you. Junior Barra, welcome to the team. Good morning, James again. Sci-Fi Mike, Robert D. Bruce, Nick the Mike. Good morning to everybody. Praise be to God. So far, 83% say history does rhyme. And uh, re- and uh, uh, everybody else is just in the repeated self category. So base. Oh no, I take the back. One percent. So that has to be at least a vote. Said history does not repeat itself. Like whole, you know, full stop. No rep- no repetition whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I, I hmm, not in that boat. That's for sure. I definitely am more inclined to think that we see. I believe we see parallels to the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Because of some of the similar patterns of economic, social uh, movement, you know, the history, I, would you say this, Dr. Taylor, I think that the history of the world is truly a history of immigration. As the pop, as the people move from the Garden of Eden out and then from getting off the ark and out, outward bound, a Babel, the Tower of Babel and out as we spread through, through uh, the continents, uh, we... We are immigrating along the way. And the fall of the Western Roman Empire was the pressure of the Khan, Genghis Khan, putting pressure on the barbarians who put pressure on the Western side of the Roman Empire. But the Romans were like, yeah, you can hang out with us, but you can't be citizens and you can fight for and die for us. So, hey, congratulations. Welcome to the team. So, Aren't we seeing some very similar patterns as far as immigration goes, as far as eco- economics goes? So that I kind of see it that way, and I go, well, that didn't end well, and I don't think this is going to end well. Do you see a scenario – I guess this is a better question. Do you sure, see sure. a scenario in which the current trajectory ends in peace and societal uh, accord without a war or a chaos or a breakdown? Well, we already have the war in, in the Ukraine, so, um, um, and, and I think, the Middle East. Again, thinking of, 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 of human history in terms of immigration is very interesting. By the way, I like that idea. Um, I mean, again, this is again my historian brain, my academic historian brain. When you you see the parallels, the first thing I think is, yeah, there was pressure on the Huns from Central Asia, from China. They pushed them into the West. A lot of what's happening today is not. It's not. It's, it's very much intentional on the part of countries. They're bringing people in in these Western countries to replace their own people. I don't think the Romans were trying to do that. And so there are differences that are important to me that like, mm. I, I can't say it's exactly the same. Again, the pattern, sure. I, 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 I actually, again, I like your idea uh, very, very well. Like, you know, people migrating is a big part of human history. Uh, for various reasons. So in a big picture sense, yeah, like people moving, people being moved around the, the, the globe like a chessboard. And that's what I see a lot of. If you wanted to see like a parallel but like from, from ancient history, I kind of see, um, and I actually wrote an essay about this on my sub stack of all things. I'd actually written it a while back and I put it up there. because Anyway, point is, uh, is between like what we're going through today and ancient Mesopotamia, where you have these, you know, the first great city states, right? Where all of a sudden you have these big cities for the first time and you have the creation of these very hierarchical societies because they're terrified by these populations. They want to control them. And that's what I see, like, uh, when I look at the world today is the reason why this stuff is happening is you have these, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and rant about the globalists, but you do have these global corporations, these global organizations, even these national elites who all identify with each other, right? These westernized elites. Who they, they want to control populations, right? That they want to control how many children get born who don't who don't get born. They want to control the resources, and they kind of see human beings as resources, right? Oh well, our population is declining. No problem. We'll just bring in like you know, um, I think it's Mary Harrington, the British writer, who coined the phrase "meat Legos." That human beings are just interchangeable slabs of meat or something. Wow. Uh, that's, Soil that's what green. This is. I mean, yeah, yeah we, so I agree. Yeah, exactly. Yikes. Right? Like, yikes. 
if we get a food crisis, we'll just feed each other to you, right? We'll make you eat That's each so other. That's so gross. Yeah. So, uh, but if, yeah, I mean, if things go exactly this way for another hundred years, yeah, there'll definitely be a societal breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> there will definitely I, be like all, off I want someone to tell me, no, Joe, things are going to be fine. You know, we're just going to be able to vote peace in, into <laughs> office and vote accord. I mean, like, I, I, I'm not a prophet. I'm not that smart, but golly gee whiz, you don't think you have to be to look at things going on and go, you know, we don't seem to be getting along better. We seem to be getting along worse. And uh, we're, we're definitely seeing some pretty, pretty big stakes things happening. The attempted assassination of a former president, the the for all intents and purposes, coup in the Democrat Party to take over run by a former president, which, by the way, uh, Barack Obama never left Washington, D.C. Uh, yes, he has the house in Nantucket. I know he's a very scared and worried about the rising seas and global climate change, I, which is why he bought a mansion on the coast mm-hmm. on an island. Anyway, he still has a house residence and an office plus a staff in Washington, D.C., where he still is playing a pivotal role in the control and power of the Democrat Party. Why is that? Did Bill Clinton do that? Nope. Did Jimmy Carter do that? Nope. Which, by the way, there was a fake story about Jimmy Carter dying during the whole July 13th thing, too. Yeah. Um, That was not true. The, The man is still still going pray for yeah Yeah, so um great we live in we live in absolute crazy times but uh then there was the 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 other parallel that i sort of hinted at which is basically being questioned right now on capitol hill you know the praetorian guard there for well they were the picker they were the winners they got to pick the winners and losers is the u.s secret service kind of doing the same thing some think so. I think so. there's no proof of that. It's pure speculation. But some are asking I mean, that senators and congressmen are asking that question right now on Capitol Hill. Kind of crazy. Well, I think you have to, the whole larger security apparatus clearly seems to have a big hand in everything now, like domestic politics, FBI, um, Secret Service, CIA. Uh, they were they they literally interfered with the election back in 2020. Everybody knows this and nobody talks about it. <laughs> oh, by the way, did I did not have not looked into this yet. But yesterday I saw and it's not a new story. It's kind of been out for a while. But yesterday I saw, which was triggering me, um, somebody else we've had on the program in the past posted an image of a document, a memo that basically suggested that the CIA was trying to manipulate the conclave that elected. Was it? Paul the sixth, I think it was Paul the sixth. Have you John seen the 23rd. that? No, it was John, John the twenty third. Was it John yeah, the twenty third? Was it Ron Colley? Yeah. Ron, Ron Colley's the guy. Yeah. But what was interesting? So you, mean, you saw it then, right? You saw the picture. Oh yeah. Oh sure, yeah. Okay. Multiple pictures actually. But what was interesting to me was in the same document it says, "Well, the, you know, hey." This is what they did with Pope Pius the Twelfth. So why not we try it again and get a guy that we like? It's, I'm paraphrasing it because I don't have it in front of me. And I'm and I'm like, wait, what? Pius the Twelfth was was rigged, really? But yet I can kind of see. I, I almost can kind of see it as as on the up and up in the sense that you're on the cusp of major conflict in Europe, the rise of the Nazis, the rise of Hitler. And who was the one guy who was spearheading the, more, the the effort for the Catholic Church? It was Eugenio <clears throat> Pacelli. As the ambassador of the nuncio to Germany, he wrote the encyclical that was published in German. He smuggled it in. So this is the time you need a guy like that. So I can see them kind of getting together and going, hey, you know what, guys? We all need Pacelli right now. That's the guy we need. And then they go into the conclave and they just kind of make that the deal. I I, I think that's I would not have an issue with that, would you? It's not surprising at all that that um, c- civil governments try to influence the election of popes. This is that, right. that doesn't surprise why, me. Yeah, why would that be surprising? Though. It's a powerful institution; it can influence events. That's why they. I mean, they, like it. it does, it's not even that. There was a book written several years ago. I haven't still haven't read. I need to read it. I can't remember the guy's name. Um, he seemed to have a lot of document. I saw I saw interviews with this this person, David something or other. He wrote a book about how he basically said that um, 
that John Courtney Murray was like working for the CIA effectively. And he tried to push the Second Vatican Council toward uh, its doctrine of religious freedom, um, more or less at their behest. Uh, and again, wouldn't shock me in the slightest. Um, again, the United States government was pushing that during the Cold War as a way to undermine the Soviets. And so we know the Soviets were doing that. There were definitely oh, yeah. agents in the Vatican. Big time. Like this. And so uh, I actually yeah. read somewhere there's a, there's a pretty good history website. It's called Orthodox History. It's by Orthodox about the history of the Orthodox Church. And they had a nice article up there a few months ago on the fact that, that the United States basically got uh, several uh, ecumenical patriarchs of Constantinople elected too. <laughs> so not surprised. They to, yeah, not, not George surprise. Weigel. I mean, they, you don't, you don't got to go too far afield. George Weigel, in his book "The End and the Beginning," points that out. He points out that that JP two was very aware which cardinals, which archbishops were on the on the KGB payroll, but he never fired yeah, them. Mean, he never removed them. Yeah, he never blocked them. He just did his own yeah. thing, and he didn't much care what happened at the Curie, which is part of my big problem with JP two. Is that yeah. because he made that decision to just do his thing and not try to uh, fix the Curia? Well, we got what we got. And when JP2 was gone, we still had all of those remnants still at the Curia, still doing their thing. Even in the post Soviet Union era, they just, they just shifted, you know, what flag they, they rose, but they were basically about the same business. That did not change. And uh, here we are still reeling from that today. By the way, Mac Thompson says, if y'all wouldn't mind, please say a quick prayer for my youngest grown son who just landed in basic training yesterday at Fort Leonard Wood. Wow. Praise be to God. Mac, we'll be praying for him for sure. I, by, by the way, I was born at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. So uh, I'll be, uh, I'll be keeping him in my, my daily rosary with my family for sure. Uh, hopefully he will he will persevere through it all. But it's let's just be honest, it's army, so it's not that tough. Okay, it's just <laughs> <sighs> it's not like the Marine Corps, you know. It's not like that, you know. So it's okay, I'm sure. And they take they probably have like quiet time or like timeouts and uh, you know safe spaces that they could go to to get in touch with their inner feelings, you know. So I'm sure it'll be just just fine. No problems there. Aren't, um, aren't, all, the, aren't all the armed I'm forces teasing. like that now under this administration? Okay. I was going to say, <laughs> <it's probably all. laughs> oh, How man, the mighty oh, have man. fallen, speaking of decline. <laughs> the mighty have fallen. Speaking of decline. Yeah, there you go. They come in cycles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Angie, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Um, Stranger Things was a dra- was a docu drama. That was like that. That was the Netflix show, right? I never even seen. I've never seen a single episode of it. I don't know. Um, Helen Grace is back on the team. Good morning to you, Helen Grace. Glad to see you here. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, I thought I, I missed a comment up above. I'm trying to. Christine, good morning. Colleen, good morning. I missed a comment. There was something earlier I saw. I wanted to bring it up, and it's now gone. I hate when that happens. Was it uh, uh, um, the book about the CIA? Oh, what was that? Uh, Brianna Klotz. Good morning, Brianna. Says Operation Gladio, the Unholy Trinity, covers all of that with the CIA. Never heard of that before. Really? Can you, yeah, that's another one, yeah. can, Jake? Can you find that? Send me that link. Yeah. I want to look that up. I'm going through the book of Church of Spies right now. Have you heard? Have you seen that book? It's about a decade old now, almost. Doctor Taylor. Yeah, I've heard of it. It's a good I've book. I'm. Re- I'm really, really enjoying it. It gets into uh, Pius XII's efforts to to uh, cooperate, actually negotiate between the conspir- the German con- general staff conspirators to kill Hitler and the English government to help make that happen, to kill Hitler and to bring about a transition in government in peace after the war. And um, – Pius XII implemented an entire spy agency, essentially, to help pass notes, and and it was just hair raising at best. It's kind of it's a it's I'm really enjoying the book. It's very very good. Um, KSW Benedict and Oblate says Joe would do a great job diving into this occult. I'll have to look into that and see if I can't find Kabbalah. It's Ka- Kabbalah Kabbalah. That's the, the Madonna thing, right? I got to look that up. I remember years ago seeing something on Madonna's wacky Jewish occultism. So we'll have to find somebody on that. We'll see how that goes. 
50 ites time. They're loyal to the to to him Brandon sadly. I'm not sure who's loyal but uh I'm not sure anybody's loyal to Brandon anymore. They seem to <laughs> drop him like a hot rock, didn't okay. they? Sharp as sharp as a tack he was one day later. That guy is old and senile. We've known it this whole time. What? What? Like, are you kidding me? No, you need to be held to account for that. Someone needs to someone needs to lose it. Kamala should get the job and then be impeached immediately because she hid that information from the American public. There you go. That's probably what needs to happen. Uh, by the way, uh, whistleblowers at Secret Service put out yesterday through Susan Crabtree at the Real Clear Politics that they – and t- there's a sharpshooter who really is complaining to the highest levels within the U.S. Secret Service, basically saying he anticipates there's going to be another attempt on Donald Trump's life before it's all over. I talked to a guy yesterday, a Hollywood screenwriter – or no, I talked to him on Sunday. Hollywood screenwriter, um, he's got some fantastic sources, by the way. And uh, he he just has – anyway, um, he predicts Donald Trump won't make it to November. That's his that's his guess. What say you? Do you think Donald Trump will make it to November? Derek, uh, Dr. Hey, Taylor? I, I, maybe uh, – I don't know. I mean it's um, – I don't know. I, mean, I, I, I hope do you they think, don't do, do something you at like least, that. Do you at least – would you at least say it's fair to say they may take another shot at him? Literally. Oh, they're definitely willing to do it. Now they that that's the thing that they've proven. They don't really care. They don't care about anything but maintaining. I, I, you know, it sounds like a cliche, right? Like, oh, they don't care. It's like a bad movie villain. All they care about is power. But that that seems to be the only thing they care about. They see him as a threat to that. And yes, I think they're totally willing to do it. Like, I, I can't believe. I still, people, you know, you mentioned a cri- the crisis came several years ago. I still can't believe we had actual evidence of the FBI, the CIA, working with these social media companies to censor stuff during the last. Right. Time. I'm like, this is yes, this, this is this is this is like a a, a bad movie. No, it's right. real. They did it. Yeah, and, exactly. they're, and they're still doing it. That, they're, yeah. they're, oh, they're still doing, doing it. it. Yeah. Facebook just in, j- just admitted to the fact that they were censoring that photo. Of Donald Trump with yes. a fist pump after July thir- on the July thirteenth. Oh yeah, um, it's a memory hole. I, it's they're totally. It, it would not. Sh- it would absolutely horrify me because I don't want to see. But it, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Mm. No. By the way, here's the book. Can I just put this on screen for a second? Paul Williams Operation Gladio, the unholy alliance between the Vatican, the CIA, and the mafia. I'm gonna have to get this book and read this book. <laughs> Four, four and a half stars. Um, this is very, very fascinating. So I'm going to have to go through this book. How old is this? When was this published? 2015. So that was a long time ago now. Uh, so we'll put that. Can we put that in the show notes today? That'd be fascinating to sure. do. I'm going to have to get that book. Uh, see see where that's going. Jane says someone said it would be would be by prison or a bomb. Okay, here's the question in my mind. If you... Pure speculation here, hypothesis, hypothetical, whatever. If you wanted to assassinate Donald Trump, why do the hard thing and try to have a public assassination? Why not just poison him? (laughs) Why not do something like, you know, there's there's probably a, a bunch of ways that you can quietly out of the public eye take your Take your chance at trying to assassinate. I don't want this. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just asking the question. Why do you why do you think that if they were going to assassinate Donald Trump, if there was a true conspiracy to assassinate Donald Trump July 13th, why would you bother with something so technically and logistically challenging as a public execution? You know what I mean? If your goal is just to kill him, take him out, take him out. I mean, do they are they competent enough to pull that off <laughs> anymore? <laughs> uh, can I they watched, do the, the clandestine assassination anymore? There was video yesterday that got released of a guy who was right in front of that building when that ha- when that happened. The FBI had confiscated his phone and they gave his phone back, and then he published that video that he took that day. And um, mm-hmm. you watch the video; it's clear there's not shots coming from a window. There's nobody up on the tower. 
water tower. Mm-hmm. And the police are surrounding for for several minutes before they're put. And this has got it got the guy's attention. He's like, "Wait, hold on, something's going on with this building right here. Why are all the cops like surrounding this place? What?" And he's even telling his buddy, "Get down, man. Stay low, because I don't know what's about to happen here." Like he, he knew something was up, and he he's standing right in front of that building, literally right there, and there's no. There's, you can pretty much tell that there's no shots coming from windows or any other place. And the cops are all zeroed in on that. You'd have to have all of those cops involved in, in part of that, or at least, you know, they'd have to, the conspiracy, I think breaks down in that part. There's still a lot of questions in my mind, but it kind of breaks down there. So maybe the kid uh, just did really want to be the next Oswald, you know, in his mind, maybe he did just want to go out in the blaze of glory and be in the history book, so to speak. But I don't know. It just seems like if you really wanted to k- take Donald Trump out, that would have been the option I wouldn't have chosen. Too hard, too complicated, too logistically challenging. Yeah. Too many X factors yeah. that could m- make it all go wrong versus poisoning him or something. You know what I mean? Like getting into his food. I'm sure he's mm-hmm. got a taste test or a cook or a chef or something, but I don't know. I don't know. What do I know? It seems crazy yeah. to me. Um, it is crazy. Let me know what you guys think about that. We're about to sign off here. Mom of nine, because they want you to see what will happen to you if you don't comply. So there is that, right? There is the uh, oh same the same aspect, the sending the message kind of a thing. But wouldn't that be too – isn't that too obvious though? Too Johnny on the spot. Already as it is, MAGA Nation or conservatives um, – they're all – most of us are asking like, hey, come on now. We, we're having a hard time believing this kid acted alone. One of the biggest – and here's the – I don't think it's the – there's no shooter on the tower in my opinion. There's no shooter in the window in yeah. my opinion. I believe the kid did pull the trigger. Yeah. The real question, the $64,000 question that really needs pressed hard is was this kid involved in any way, shape, or form in forums online that involved undercover FBI agents? Fanning his flame. That's the it question. Been he needs just, solid answers. I mean, it could have been just them, you know, it's possible they could have heard, like they could have had knowledge about this kid and then just sort of like, right. they didn't intentionally stick him up, but they let, let it go. They didn't, they just sort of, you know, told him not to take it too serious or something like that. Or just that. And it's plain incompetence. Like the combination of the two is like, we kind of want this guy to get shot. We kind of have to sort of at least go through the motions of, to protect him yeah. or something. But well, um, I, I would argue tell. that that the that the because I had Chris Kyle on. I have also I had Steve Friend on as well. Chris Kyle brought this up and he's like, listen, you know, you don't have to have an evil intent to get the same result. The U.S. Secret Service, the U.S. Secret Service leadership could simply have yeah. said, we don't like you, Donald Trump. So you get the JV team. Yeah. yeah, we don't possible. like you. Yeah. So you get the B yeah. team. Have fun, buddy, pal. Enjoy that one, right? So it just sense. could be. It could just be malice. It could just be like you know, uh, juvenile malice. At the end of the day, um, similarly, malice the FBI. Yeah, exactly. The the FBI similarly could said, you know what? We we don't want Donald Trump to die, but this is our strategy. We get into these chat groups, we find degenerates, and we fan their flame <laughs> until we can arrest them. And maybe this one got out of control. You know, it, mm. we all waiting to figure out now, Christopher Ray did testify on Capitol Hill that he, he said the FBI had no, no contact. No, no. It was the guy yesterday. And if his name is escaping me, I believe he said, cause he was asked by one of the senators, the FBI had no contact, prior contact with Thomas Matthew Crooks prior to this event. None, no contact. That's what was testified to. If it comes out that he was in a chat box because they already seemingly misrepresented the, uh, the kid's social media post on Gab because the CEO of Gab has come out and released the, 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 the actual post, which seems to indicate that if that, in fact, is Matthew Crooks' post, he was a liberal. He was pro-immigration, oh. pro-COVID lockdown, pro-Biden, anti-Trump. So there seems to be some shenanigans there for sure that needs answering. So we'll never, I guess we'll never know. We're going to have to wait for the, uh, the next Oliver Stone film to come out to get any true answers out of these things. Did did you see, um, Andrew Torba's expose about that? I did. Yeah. Yeah. 
It was, um, uh, and then Elon Musk retweeted that and said, "It sure looks like the FBI leadership engaged in perjury," and that of uh, course got a ton of attention. So I got a, I'm a Gab, I'm a Gab, I have a Gab account. I don't use it all that often, but I, I have a Gab what? account, and um, and I only post my anti-Trump rhetoric there. That's yes. it. It's only, it's only you know, I'm <laughs> yes. teasing. I, I'm just I'm I'm only just a teasing. liberal on Gab. <laughs> That's right. I'm teasing. Um, no, I, I did get an email. I did get an email like last week hmm. from Andrew Torba because I'm a user. He sent it to all users basically saying, hey, the FBI has put a hold on this information. They they contacted us. They said Matthew Crooks had a, an account on our platform and that we were not allowed to delete this information until the investigation is complete. Mm-hmm. We have held the information. We are not deleting it. And then – and then because it was starting to come out that, oh, he was in, he was a pro-Trump Republican, Andrew Torbo said, well, here's the actual posts, and it seems to suggest something completely different. And yesterday on, on, uh, on Capitol Hill, they, um, they seem to want to talk out of both sides of the mouth, mm. the FBI and the Secret Service and all of that. So <clears throat> we live in very interesting times, to say the least. Lori says Hillary – is is what as out there to be afraid hillary is what lori hillary's out there be afraid kamala be very oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) Uh, oh ouch yeah she's getting you think you think kamala's gonna get the hillary treatment okay if you're a betting person what do you think the chances are come dnc in chicago Kamala is not on the ticket and Hillary shows up as a, as a candidate, a leading candidate, or is, is it too late for that? And Kamala is the choice who uh, no one loves Kamala. Nobody on the Democrat side loves Kamala. She's not popular. She's not well loved. Yesterday, there were reports. Turning Point USA went to the rally that she had in, in a stadium. They had some rapper there with a con- doing a concert thing, you know, speaking vulgarities, in front of families and kids or whatever. And then as soon as the rapper ended, 10 minutes into Kamala's speech, the place starts emptying out during her talk, during her speech. People are getting up and leaving because they don't care about her. They cared about the con- the concert they were getting. You know, golly gee whiz. Going back to parallels. Is this not a case where the emperor throws bread out to the, to the masses just to keep him satisfied, Dr. Taylor? I mean... We're getting the kid rocked and the uh, the gangster rap treatment these days. Is that not the bread thrown to the masses to keep us keep us uh, under under control? Like our our bread. bar is way too low. Bread and circus. This is a a time honored tradition. <laughs> man, oh man! Uh, that's, that's a, I mean, it's, it's hard to say something repeats if it never ended in the first place. Uh, it's just a continuous stream of like nonsense, and so. But yeah, it, it's, you know, it is everything like, again, cultural decline. Absolutely. Like you can see it, you can feel it. It's everywhere around you. Um, it's just weird that it's, um, yeah, the, the forms that's taking are a freak show or just absolute freak show. That uh, Olympic yeah. thing was just the sort of crowning of it in a lot of ways. Uh, we're almost out of time here, but um, uh, Mac Thompson brings up Kamala Mark Kelly ticket. You think Mark Kelly's going to be the running mate there? Who should be my <laughs> running mate for Holy Roman Emperor? That's what I want to know. Who should be? Who should I choose as my running mate for Holy Roman Emperor? Funny Let me know in the comments. People laugh, but uh, the emperor usually was elected. They had electors. I know. Yeah, that's what that, that's I'm, my, I'm, my, my, exactly. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm running. People, people are like, yeah, "Oh, it's funny, Joe, you're electing a king." No, the Holy Roman Emperor was. He elected. was elected. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he was elected. Yeah, I want to be Charles. You who had to didn't run like Martin Luther. By the way, <laughs> yes, we need another Holy Roman Emperor to remind us of the bad guys. Exactly. And if you elect me. Free ice cream for everybody. There we go. All the time. Ice cream and circuses. Ice cream and circuses. And gangster rap, too. You can have your gangster (laughs) rap. Or is that country music? I can't tell anymore. Who knows? Anyway, we'll see you right back here tomorrow. Father Chris Alar will be here. God love you.